I will now turn it over to Mr. Bill LaRousse from Ryder University. Thank you, Tony. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm from Ryder University. My name is Bill LaRousse. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Admission at Ryder. But I'm not here to talk about Ryder today specifically. I'm here to talk about the college admission process in general. And I hope that at least some of the information I'm about to uh, discuss with you uh, will be of use to you. How many of you in the audience, this is your first time going through the college admission process? OK, a fair number of you. For those of you who this isn't the first time, I'm sure that you have experiences that you can add to uh, the general good. Um, we'll leave a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end of the session, but I know we have a time schedule to keep, so we're going to move pretty quickly. First of all, the decision process that you're about to undergo and that the students are about to undergo is going to be slightly different for every student and for every family. But it is a complete process as represented by the circles behind me. Each process, however, is going to vary in terms of what's the most important thing to, to the family. But there are three general areas that I think, if you're able to focus on these, however important they are to you, you're going to make some really good decisions over the next few months and over the next year. First of all, you have the academic component. If you ask most students why they want to go to college, they're going to say things like, I want to get a good job. I want to get a good education. I want to be successful. And a lot of that has to do with the academic quality of the institution, the offerings of the institution. And so if you know what you want to major in, you can zone in pretty specifically, but even if you can't, you can look at things like uh, the size of the classes, the, uh, the, the credentials of the faculty, the success of the alumni, all of which can be tied back to the academic quality of the institution. What are the career opportunities? How do we help students develop their, um, their personal skills, their professional skills, so that they can go out and be successful uh, adults. In addition, regardless of the quality of the institution, a student can't really fully reach his potential unless he's comfortable in the environment in which he is studying. So the size of the classes, the, the size of the campus, the location of the campus, near or far, um, see lots of students who go 1,200 miles away in the freshman year and then come back in the sophomore year because they're homesick. So to, the, to whatever extent possible, visiting a college campus is going to give you the best opportunity to determine not only whether the campus feels right, but whether that travel feels right to you. So over the next few months as you're approaching college deadlines, if you haven't done so already, it really is a wise move to visit college campuses. And you're lucky because you do live in New Jersey that has a wealth of colleges and universities that you can look at. So if you haven't been on any college visits yet, just to get a sense of what types of colleges are out there, what feels right to you, is really important. So we'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But the environment is a critical piece not to be undervalued when you're making that decision. And then finally, and not least is the financial component. How about affordability? Will I be able to afford four years at that institution? And we'll be talking about that affordability component as well. What I'll tell you right off the bat, though, is if you're looking at different kinds of institutions, don't start with the sticker price. Keep it in mind. But know that. There's financial aid and scholarships available, and the general rule of thumb is private institutions like Ryder and other institutions tend to have larger scholarships and financial aid programs to go along with their larger price tags. And oftentimes when you're comparing a private school that might seem kind of out of reach with a public institution that you're assuming is not going to be, the bottom line at the end of the day is not going to be all that much different between those institutions. So at the early stages, really look for that fit. Look for that 
environment that you like, the, education pro the educational programs, the quality of those majors, the quality of the experience the student's going to have, and keep price in mind as part of that. And remember that this decision-making process does not stop with submitting the application. It goes right through almost a year from now, May 1st of the student's senior year. Okay. And then kind of get a sense of what do you know and what don't you know. And what don't you know can tell you as much about your college choices as what you do know. Do you know what your career goals are? If you're interested in becoming an engineer, then obviously you want to look at institutions that have schools of engineering. And I know that sounds like one of those duh statements, but you know what? Every year I have a student come up to me during orientation and say, can you tell me where the engineering advisor is or the pharmacy advisor? And I say to them, well, we don't have those majors. And it's kind of sad for me to think that this student has gone through the entire year, the application process, all these opportunities to visit and research us online and not know what our majors are. And I hate to have that student try to find that right fit so late in the year. So it really is important to do some homework. If you don't know what your career goals are, it's fairly simple. You want to look for an institution that's going to give you a wide variety of subjects to choose from. So a college that has a liberal arts base is often going to be a good place to start because you can springboard into so many different areas from a liberal arts institution. Academic interests kind of go hand in hand. Sometimes we're not so much thinking long-term career goals as we are what I'm really passionate about. I really have always wanted to study English literature. I'll figure out the rest later on. And that's okay. I know it makes parents a little uncomfortable, but here's a question to ask when you're looking at these colleges. My son or daughter wants to major in theater. What can you tell me about the success of, of your alumni? What can you tell me about what the music majors or the philosophy majors have done after graduation? Check their website. See what their career services website says. Talk to people when you go to open houses and ask those really specific questions because the one thing you want a student to do that will make her successful for her entire life is if she's able to pursue something that she's passionate about. And I teach a, a freshman seminar. I just had my second meeting with them this week. I work with the undeclared students. Many of them have no idea what they want to major in, so they're just in the process of discovering what they're passionate about. That is okay. It's a good place to be. Lifestyle and learning style. Am I going to be comfortable studying in a quiet suburban campus or do I really thrive on the, heart, uh, on the beat of, a, of an urban campus? Those are very real considerations. And if you know one of those things, that helps you to narrow down your choices. The location we've talked about a little bit already. Do I want to go around the corner and up the street to Ryder? Or do I want to go to California? Or do I want to go abroad? Those are all really valid pieces of the puzzle. And you need to pay attention to what you're hearing from your students. And, what the, and students, you need to think about those things. But think about them completely. Think about the... Um, uh, the travel time. Think about the fact that if you go far away, you may not get home until the end of the semester, and that may be right up your alley. But if it's not, I challenge you because I think you would probably find an institution that's just as exciting right around the corner as the, as the one you found across the country, and vice versa. Don't limit yourself because you think you want to be close to home. You may find that being farther away from home is perfectly comfortable for you. Budget we've already uh, touched upon, but yes, you do need to have a sense of what your budget is because even with financial aid and scholarships, even with institutions that have fairly large financial aid packages, at the end of the day, you need to pay the balance. And you need to know what your budget is roughly going in so you can have that conversation with the admissions counselors and the financial aid counselors at the institutions you're considering. And for all of these questions, I don't know is a valid answer. You can still find a good college for you, that, that perfect fit, even if you don't have all of those answers. 
Okay. So once you kind of have to do that little self inventory, you want to start building your list. Students in the audience, how many of you pretty much have your short list of colleges you're going to apply to? Can't really see. Did anybody raise your hand? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah. Okay. For some of you, that's still happening right now, and that's fine. You're right in that moment where you're building that list. Most colleges have deadlines that are coming up anywhere in the next month to the next three or four months, so you're in the right place right now. A few places that you might want to go to help you to build that list. College Board has an excellent college search website. Naviance is also a really good tool. Those visits that you get from, from college representatives right here in your own high schools are a good way for you to start to kick the tires a little bit and decide, you know what, nope, I'm not interested in a school like that. I'd rather go to a school more like this. College guides, yes, they still print those, but a lot of them are online. Peterson's, things like that. You can get some good general information from those. I would caution you in looking at external guides like the College Board website, Naviance, etc. Their information is usually about a year out of date because they survey institutions during the previous academic year. So once you see something you like, the best thing to do is get in touch with that college directly. Your school counselors. If you're overlooking the wealth of knowledge that your school counselor has, Stop doing that because they have visited lots of colleges. They've been through this process with so many students before. Even if you're just bouncing ideas off of people, the college counselor is the best place to go. And you happen to have a really strong college counseling office here at Lawrence. So take full advantage of it. Your teachers. If you know that you want to study mathematics, and you have a favorite mathematics teacher and you haven't talked to that teacher about his or her passion for math and how, where they went to school or what, they, what you should look for in a mathematics program at a college, you're also missing a really great resource. Teachers are phenomenal resources for um, where's a good place to go for, for career preparation. Um, how did you get into what you got into? The college websites, now that you've done some general shopping, you've done a little one-stop stuff with the college board, etc. now you really want to start digging into those colleges. Look around their websites. Everything from what majors they offer to the size of the classes and other basic statistics to the application process. That information is really valuable. And once you get that short list, just bookmark half a dozen colleges so that whenever you need to go back to them, you can get to them quickly. Friends and family, you're gonna, everybody's going to ask you at Thanksgiving, so where did you apply? Did you get in yet? You know, be prepared for those questions, but also be prepared to turn the question around and say, so why did you choose the college that you chose? What did, what did my cousin do to find the best college? Those are things that sometimes family can give you some really good insights. But take any of those with a grain of salt. If you're, if you're using a variety of resources, you're probably going to have the most balanced picture. And the magazine rankings. Not so much a fan of the magazine rankings. I know what goes into the, I got, know what goes into the rankings, and they're not always the most valid. I would say if you're using magazine rankings, use them as a cursory, okay, this college is in the top 20 in the Northeast, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's a, that's a legitimate school for me to be looking at, but don't stop there because the rankings don't tell you anything about those fit components that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes it's just a map and a dartboard. Okay. Now it's time to actually visit those colleges. Definitely check the college websites. Once you have that short list, you want to be able to go to the website, find out what kinds of visits are available. Do they have open houses? An open house is a great way to do one-stop shopping, see lots of people in a relatively short period of time, and get a good overview of the institution. 
a tour and, or an information session might be a little more intimate, but you're not going to meet as many people when you go for an event like that. I like students to come to Rider for a student for a day program where they can sit in on classes in the area that they're interested in studying, shadow a student, eat in the dining hall, and really feel as close as they can to what it's like to be a student on campus. I think that kind of a visit is especially valuable if, they have the, if you have the opportunity to go back for a second or a third visit to get a real sense of whether this is my good, my final choice. We have a lot of students do those kinds of visits at Rider after they get their acceptance letters because now they're ready to make a final decision. Sometimes a drive-by, and this is a little outside the timeliness of this because a lot of people will do drive-bys during their summer vacations. If you're doing a sweep and you want to visit three colleges in New England, but you think, oh, you know, I'm driving right past the University of Vermont. Let me drive through the campus and get a feel for that. That's okay, but just understand that you're not getting the same experience that you're getting if you actually go and sit and talk with people and interact with them. We often get the question, should I visit more than once? Absolutely. We have a big open house coming up at Ryder on Sunday, and we're going to see lots and lots of students. But I always tell them, come back and visit again when you can spend a little more time with us one-on-one. -on -one. You've seen the campus. You like what you see. But I don't expect you to have all of the answers about whether Ryder is the right institution for you based on that one visit. So come back for a student for a day or bring dad back because he couldn't make it with you to the open house and take him on a tour. We welcome you, and I, when I say we, I mean colleges across the land, welcome you to come back as many times as you like and encourage you to do so because if you deposit and enroll at Ryder, we want you to stay. So as much as you need to do to make sure that that's a good decision for you, we're going to encourage you to do it and help you to do it. Does visiting matter? If you haven't visited any colleges, this is kind of an abstract question, but you definitely want to get out there and see for yourself. Every year, again, in the summertime, I meet students at orientation, their first time to campus. I have a student in my freshman seminar who comes from California. She didn't sh see the campus for the first time until her very first day in September. Actually, it was late August. She came for move-in. I said, boy, you're adventurous. She said, well, yeah, I know people who, who attended, and I'm really happy here, and that's great. I'm, I'm glad she is. But that's a risk, a risk that I wouldn't recommend anybody take, especially if they're putting a deposit down that's non-refundable. So you definitely want to get that, those visits in. If you can't do it before you apply, definitely do it afterwards. you may be looking at colleges that aren't so close to home and maybe you won't have to, excuse me have the time to visit those colleges right off the bat you may not get to them until you're admitted definitely connect with the regional representatives and again the best way to do that is is the visits that they actually make to Lawrence High School at Ryder Eric Gerwitz is the counselor that who works with Lawrence High School he knows the school he knows all of the students who apply and he reads all the applications. So even if in an institution as close as Ryder, you still have someone who is specifically assigned to know you. And that's a great person for you to connect with because you'll also get somewhat of a feel for the campus through that person. Some institutions use alumni. So if you're looking at a school that's halfway across the country, there may be alumni who live in the area that you can connect with and ask all of the questions that you want. And I encourage you to do that. Okay, so we're back to making the list. Now you're getting ready to apply. You've maybe visited some schools. There are some you haven't visited. Make that list because now what you want to do is start to map out, and Naviance is a great tool for this, Ma map out the deadlines of those institutions, the requirements of those institutions so that you can keep in step. Because if you're not, if you haven't been a real organized person up until this point, it's a great way to, to 
make a calendar, make a spreadsheet, do whatever you can so that you're not missing deadlines, you know which colleges have which requirements, and you have to start with that list. The question, how many colleges is too many to apply to? Well, I think that's a theoretical question because every time I ask a group of people, I'm astounded by the one person who says, I'm applying to 20 colleges. Well, I'm applying to 25. I'm applying to 50. Yes, 50. I'm thinking you need a full-time job just to pay those application fees. If you're applying to 50 colleges, I'm thinking you probably haven't done a whole lot of the homework that I've just spent a few minutes talking about. That's excessive. But sometimes 20 is right for a student. I think you could probably hone it down even better with a little more research. But there is no right number. It has to be right for you. I would say on average students are applying right now to about eight colleges, wouldn't you say, Tony? But if it's only three for you, and I'll see, you'll see later on, for some students, it's only one. I've already kind of touched upon this, so I'm going to move on in the interest of time. This is an important topic. There are so many different deadline structures out there, and this is really where you need to speak directly with the high school, uh, with the college, uh, either go to their website, speak with the representative, visit the campus, call the admissions office. Because you're going to hear all of these terms and it's going to make your head spin. The first two, early action and early decision. The best way to keep those two straight is early action is non-binding and early decision is binding. And I'll start actually with early decision. Early decision basically means that if you apply to a particular institution, that institution will get you a decision back fairly quickly. Early decision deadlines usually start around October 15th and roll up to around December 1st with the promise that they will get you a decision usually by the end of December, sometimes earlier. The trick is, Early decision, when I say it's binding, you are actually entering into a contract with that institution that says, by applying early decision, I agree that if you admit me, I will withdraw any other applications that I have out there because I am committed to coming to you and I will sign on the dotted line. So you're making that commitment to an institution before you even apply. Early decision is usually right for maybe 1% of any given group of people if that. Very small percentage. Who should apply early decision? You've visited that campus multiple times. Maybe you have a connection, uh, a teacher who's been talking about it since you were in ninth grade, or a legacy with family who have attended the institution before. You really know the institution. You love the institution, and it's the only place that you've ever wanted to go. And if you, enro if you are admitted, you're never going to look back. If that describes you and a particular institution, then if they offer early decision, then you might want to consider it. Do not apply early decision if you're thinking, yeah, you know, I really like Ryder, but I think I also like Rutgers, and I think I also like Penn State. We don't offer early decision, by the way, but I'm just using those as examples. If you're thinking multiple colleges, do not apply early decision because you don't want to lock yourself into that agreement. Early action offers a lot of the same advantages to you without that binding agreement. You can still apply early and get your decision from the institution early, but you still have time to consider other institutions. You can apply to multiple institutions early action, but you can only apply to one institution early decision. Some schools will have an early decision or early action and then also a preferred deadline for the rest of the applications. Typically, that's the deadline by which you should apply for full consideration at every major in the institution and for full consideration for scholarships. So you don't want to miss that preferred deadline even if you're not applying for one of the early options. You definitely want to pay attention to those. And when you hear rolling admission, that means a lot of different things but basically the same thing across the board. The similarity is that 
rolling admission implies that the institution will continue to accept applications as long as there are seats available in their entering class and will stop accepting once those classes, once those seats are filled. That doesn't mean that it's open enrollment. It, it, some of those institutions are quite competitive in terms of admission, but they will continue to ex, uh, consider applications as long as space is available. If you, Rider, for example, is rolling admission, but we also have a preferred scholarship deadline. So you can apply as late as you want, but there may be funding that was available three months ago that's not available now, so pay attention to those things. Best thing to do to avoid confusion, these are really good places to start your conversations with admission counselors. I know many of you are probably have already started a common application or are in the process of completing one. The common application is widely accepted by hundreds and hundreds of institutions across the country, and it's a really great tool. I like the common application as well. You do want to ask the institution, do they have a preference? If you accept the common application, but you also have your own application, which one do you prefer that I complete? At Rider, it doesn't matter. We really don't care. We offer two as a matter of convenience. But some institutions might prefer that you use their own application. Not a bad question to ask. Every college has an application fee. It's usually a non-refund, or most colleges have an application fee. It's usually not refundable. If you cannot afford the application fees at all of the colleges that you're applying to, speak with your guidance counselor because you can get a written request for a fee waiver. The transcript. This is really the heart of any college application. Every college requires a high school transcript, usually grades 9 through 11 and 12th grade courses in progress. Test scores. SAT, ACT, scores like that are used by most institutions, but there are a growing number of schools that are test optional. We'll talk about those in a moment. Recommendations. Find out how many recommendations the institution wants and where they should come from. If an institution requires a teacher recommendation from a, maybe a particular teacher, maybe a math teacher because you're applying to an engineering program, now is the time to start talking to your, professor, your teachers about writing letters of recommendation. Don't wait until three days before the deadline and, and go up to your favorite teacher and say, can you write me a recommendation? Because those deadlines I was talking about are not just submitting the application, they're submitting the complete file the transcript, the test scores, the recommendations, the essays, lists of activities and experiences. You can even do a resume through, through Naviance, through the College Board. If the institution requires interviews, here's a question for you. Is the interview going to be used in the admission process or, or is it just an exchange of information? Ryder grants, informa uh, grants uh, interviews but we don't use them as a requirement. They simply give us more insight into the students. So they can really only help, they can't hurt by exchanging information. Other institutions use the results of the interview, how you present yourself, how well you answer those questions. Sometimes institutions will have alumni who will conduct those interviews and don't assume because they're alumni that they're not closely involved in the admission process because typically they are. If you are applying to a finer performing arts program, dance, theater, visual arts, music, things like that, you may re be required to do an audition or submit a portfolio, and you're going to want to make sure that you know how to and when to schedule those auditions. Okay. On the transcript, we see basic things like GPA, class rank, class rank quality of the course selection. What do I mean by that? If you've had the opportunity to take honors courses, accelerated courses, AP courses, you've gone beyond the minimum requirements in subjects like math or foreign language or science or things like that, those all speak to the quality of a student's academic program. And when we're looking at a transcript, 
the GPA only tells us part of the story. I don't, does Lawrence report rank? You do, okay. Many institutions don't look at rank so much anymore because many schools don't report it. But the rank in class only gives you a piece of the picture, but perhaps a quite valid one. It gives us a sense of where you're performing in the context of the high school that you're coming from. And that is a part of the process for some schools. We don't use rank, but many institutions do. Grade trends. Two students, 3.0 GPA. One's a shoe in Great grades, impressive program. In fact, every year the students' grades have improved from ninth grade through 11th grade and maybe even into the first marking period. Another student, 3.0, different story. They passed each other on the slope. This student, unfortunately, is on the down slope. And that 3.0 GPA is hanging on by a thread because last year the student was getting C's and D's. Very different stories there. Colleges and universities have lots of admissions counselors and reviewers who are looking at these very detailed pieces of the puzzle. And they will go beyond just the GPA or the rank in class or any other one figure to look at how well the student has done. Because the bottom line is, what we see on that transcript is the strongest indicator of the student's success in the freshman year and beyond at my institution. Senior courses. Every once in a while I'll hear somebody say, well, you know, the senior year doesn't matter. Junior year is the most important year. And I always say, who told you that? And it was usually some kid who was sitting in the seat next to him. The reality is every year is important. The junior year is the most important year if that's the year you're in. It does have a strong influence on what direction that trend is going in. But in, often, in many cases, colleges will ask for mid-year grades or first marking period grades in the senior year before they make a final decision. We do that about a third of the time at Ryder. I'm not going to be as inclined to care what the student's senior grades are like if the student's not taking anything academic in the senior year. So we want to see that strong academic program continue into the senior year. Test scores, should I take the SAT or ACT? First of all, that's a good question to ask your institution. Many institutions will accept either one. I think there are very few that only accept one or the other, but there are some out there. Do they prefer one over the other? most of them will say no. The ACT is a different kind of measurement than the SAT and sometimes students will do better on one than on the other. One thing that you want to think about though is taking the SAT or the ACT more than once. How many Saturdays do I have to give up? Well my answer is if, if you're applying to institutions that require these tests, I would say two or three. Six or seven, no. One, no. No one should take the SAT just once. Even if you got really good scores and you're really pleased with them, what if your scores went up 100 points and you got into a higher scholarship range? Would you turn that down? I also challenge people, if you've taken the SAT or ACT in the junior year, take it at least once in the senior year, because statistically, the odds are in your favor that your scores will improve between your junior and your senior year. You've had that much more academic work under your belt, and sometimes students having taken the test for the second time, have relaxed a little bit, become more familiar with it, and were able to do well. How many have heard the term super scoring? Okay, a lot of institutions do this. And basically, it's very simple. We will take the highest components from the SAT, for example, even if they're from different testing dates. So we will take the highest mathematics because it was in the junior year, but the highest critical reading score is in the uh, October of the senior year. We'll take those two scores from different testing dates and put them together to make up a composite score. Some schools will also super score the ACT similarly. So another good reason to take the test more than one, more than once. And another good reason to ask institutions how they use 
all of the test scores that they receive. College Board will allow you to do, or the Educational Testing Service, will allow you to select which SAT scores you send. You have to send the entire test date, but you can opt not to send your March of your junior year scores and only send October of your senior year. If the institution super scores and they don't penalize students for lower scores, which I think is in the majority, send them all your scores because that way you're absolutely sure that they're, they've got your best scores. Can't use your March SAT if you don't send it to me. And then finally, test optional. There are a growing number of institutions that do no longer require SATs for all of their applicants. There are as many different varieties of test optional out there as there are institutions that offer them very seriously. Some totally don't require the SAT or ACT. They only want to see your transcript, maybe a writing sample, things like that. Others require the test score, but only after the student has been admitted for statistical purposes. Some institutions will require the test um, for certain programs. We don't require it for liberal arts, but we do require it for nursing, that kind of thing. So if you see test optional, you want to make sure you have a very clear understanding of what that means and how it impacts you if you do submit your test scores. Recommendations. Are they required or not? Speak with the, high, speak with the college uh, admission office and find out how many they require. Will they take them if they're not required or do they not want, even want you to submit them? Some institutions really just don't want you to submit them because they're not going to review them. Other institutions won't require them, but they'll say, if you submit them, we'll look at them and we'll take them into consideration. If the school requires a, rec a recommendation, Make sure you get that recommendation in on time along with the transcript. Anything that they require, they're going to review and they won't review your application until they receive it. How many? If they only require one, most cases they want it specifically from the school counselor who can talk about the student's overall ability or the overall preparedness for performance in the freshman year of college. Things that we don't see on the high school transcript. The fact that the student strived through uh, a personal circumstance that really distracted them from their best work in the junior year, or a, a death in the family, or the student really came into her own in the junior year and discovered a love for sciences and is now taking the toughest courses in the, in the, in the, uh, in the school. Maybe the GPA overall isn't the strongest, but there's a real sense of that student has really performed well. Institutions that require recommendations are going to look at those things. If more than one recommendation is required, find out where the other one is coming from. It's usually one from a guidance counselor, maybe another from a teacher. We also will accept letters of recommendation from employers, coaches, um, government officials. We even get recommendations from people that you call mom and dad. And we tend to take those with a little bit more of a grain of salt. But yeah, we do see those. The college essay, the bane of most high school seniors' existence. Oh my gosh, I have to write an essay, and if I don't say exactly the right thing, they're going to take my application out back and burn it. That's not true. But here's a, here's a tip. The, if you look at the, the array of college essays, and just look at the Common App, for example, and, and look at those questions and really read between the lines, they're all different ways of asking you about you. If you are writing about your experiences, your goals, your desires, whatever um, makes you, you, and gives you your passion for life, those are the kinds of things we want to see in the essay. One of the greatest mistakes, I see, or the most frequent mistakes I see, is in a very common essay question, which is basically, tell us about the most influential person in your life. And I get these really great biographies of grandma, or Aunt Jean, or Martin Luther King, but what I don't get 
is a sense of how that influence affected the student. So set the, set the stage, tell us who that person is and why they influenced you, but then translate it back to, and because of that, I found my love of history and I want to be a history teacher when I get out of college. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. So if you're writing about yourself, you're in really good shape. And when I say who should write it, yeah, we can tell when it hasn't been written by you, so don't try it. Spell check is a really powerful tool. And there isn't a writer out there, the best writers that you've ever read, all have editors. There isn't a piece of writing that I let leave my desk before somebody else has had the chance to review it. And that helps you to avoid the embarrassment of writing an essay to Rutgers University that says, in conclusion, I really, really, really want to go to Montclair State. Okay? Those things happen all the time. You need somebody to edit to make sure that what you think you're saying is actually what you're saying. Spell check doesn't catch everything. How are we doing on... All right, we're, we're good on time. Activities. If we give you a space on the application to write about your activities, your awards and honors, your, your employment, don't leave that section blank. Let us know what your activities are. We're not looking for a laundry list. We are looking for quality. We're looking for things like longevity, commitment to activities, things that you have progressed in, things perhaps that you've had leadership roles in. I'd rather see two or three or four or five really quality experiences. And it doesn't matter what the experience is. If people make fun of you because you're in the basket weaving club, but you are the best basket weaver in central New Jersey, I want to hear about that. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. Okay? Make sure that, that you are putting your best foot forward and telling us really what you've done well at. Auditions, two things to keep in mind with auditions. Make sure you look at those colleges early, see what their audition schedule is, and get your audition scheduled as early as possible because that's a big part of the admission process. And if you've gotten your application in for a January 15th deadline and know you've already missed a couple of auditions, you may have to wait a little bit longer for your decision. So do that homework up front and you'll find yourself a lot happier. Prepare for the audition, and I think those of you who are applying for audition-based programs probably know this, but colleges will tell you what to prepare and how to prepare it. They want a monologue, they want a, a classical piece, they want you to, uh, a jazz or a modern piece. Know up front what they're looking for so that you can begin to prepare. And some colleges and universities will allow you to submit audition via recording. So you can do that, or, the audition, or um, uh, portfolios via uh, electronic files. So you don't always have to go to that institution. OK, lastly, so you've gone through all of this. Now you've gotten your letter of admission, and you're in, and you're done. I can, rela I can relax. I can breathe. No, you can't. You're still in school. You have the rest of your senior year to go. We've admitted you on the faith that you will perform at least as well in your senior year as you did through, as you did through the first three years. If we see a significant decline in grades, we reserve the right to reevaluate your admission and do something really ugly called rescind. You don't ever want to be in that position, so keep your grades up. The financial piece may not come into full focus for some of the schools you've been admitted to until after you've been admitted. The FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, isn't even available until January of your senior year. Find out what the deadline is for filing the FAFSA. You don't necessarily have to wait until you get the letter of admission. You can s select up to 10 colleges on the FAFSA so you get your process done as early as possible. And you can start to compare financial aid packages, scholarships, and things like that. 
most colleges have something called a net price calculator on their website where you can get a, a very rough estimate of how much you might pay based on academic criteria, based on your family's income. Take those very roughly because they don't necessarily reflect the full financial aid you might receive at those institutions. Attend, if you've been to visit campuses, go back and attend admitted student events because those events are specifically designed to answer questions that you will have as an admitted student. What are the residence halls like? Um, you know, I'd like to meet the professors now. These are the kinds of things that you want to go back to a campus and visit. The national response date for um, uh, responding to any offer of, of admission is typically May 1st. Most colleges adhere to that. Unless you've applied early decision, a college should not be pressuring you to make a decision before that time. You absolutely want to make sure that you are given full time to weigh financial aid, go back and visit, make sure that you're making the right decision. That's a national reply date. And then, of course, in the summer, and the spring and the summer, you'll do placement testing, you'll go for orientation, and all of these things happen before you sit in classes in September. Okay, so I think we've left a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, I can't really see out here, so if you raise your hands, I'm not sure I'm going to know it. Yes. The question was, if you apply to a given university, can you apply to more than one of its colleges? And that's going to vary from institution to institution. I know, for example, at Rutgers, you can apply to up to three colleges on the same application. At Ryder University, you apply to one college or one major, but you can apply undeclared or you can apply to a particular major, but the process is fairly simple to switch from one to another if you change your mind after admission. Good question to ask the institution, especially multiple college institutions. Other questions? Oh, there's one all the way over there. Phil Donahue show. Hi. What do you think about this move away from putting so much emphasis on the SAT scores? The question was, what do you think about the move against the emphasis on SAT scores in college admission? It, that, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Actually, I've been in the college admissions game for over 27 years, and every place that I've worked has done studies that showed that the greatest emphasis should be placed on the student's high school record and that the test scores should be used in conjunction with the high schools, in, in, in conjunction with the test scores. The interesting thing is, that's exactly how the SAT was designed. Our generation and our, and our sons and daughters' generations are the ones that have gotten really hyped up about the, the SAT or the ACT, because it's an easy thing to look at. It's an easy thing for magazines to point to and say, this institution is good because their average SATs are X. But the reality is, the SAT or ACT score is meaningless unless I see the context of the student's high school record. That's number one. Number two, colleges across the land are really starting to examine whether or not the SAT or ACT has significant added value to the predictive, to the process of predicting who's going to be the most successful at their institutions. And that's a very much individual institution to institution conclusion. So that's why you're seeing so many schools go test optional. But even if I'm not test optional, and, and you know, people will ask me at Ryder, what are the average SATs for the incoming students? And I'll give them those figures. But I also say, you know what? It's much more likely that I'm going to admit a student who has a really strong grade average and has challenged herself academically whose SAT or ACT scores are significantly below average 
than it is that I would ever admit a student whose test scores are well above average but has not been performing well in school. Because I've seen what happens to those students when they get to Ryder or any other institution. They don't do well because they don't have the practice, they don't have the, the discipline, they don't have the skills to perform well in the classroom, which is what they're gonna be doing when they're at Ryder. Um, my question is scholarships. How are the students, um, I guess, selected for the scholarships? Is it based on academics? Is it based on financial need? How will you know? How are students selected for scholarships? It depends on the scholarship and it does depend on the institution. Generally speaking, if you're talking about academic merit, the high school GPA or ranking class will, will come into play. If the test scores are also a factor, which they are at many institutions, it'll be a combination of test scores and SAT sc uh, test scores and high school transcript. There are other factors that may be considered, and again, this is something where you really want to look at the college website, talk to the admissions counselors. They may add points for gener uh, demonstration of leadership. If it's a, an audition-based program, the audition results may have a significant um, component, may be a significant component of awarding the scholarship. There may be scholarships that have nothing to do with academics, but are based purely on leadership or uh, other kinds of activities. Um, there are scholarships that are endowed at most institutions by alumni and other interested parties that might simply have to do that you're a left-handed cellist from Lawrenceville. And you may be the only left-handed cellist from Lawrenceville that applies to X institution. You just got yourself a scholarship. I was going to add to scholarships that one of our counselors sends out the scholarship newsletter. Um, so if that hasn't come out, that should come out at some time. That's all the local scholarships. That was one of the later examples that Bill made that don't have as much to do with academics. Some do, but have to do with uh, specific uh, qualities of, of the student. I'm going to make a plug for your upcoming financial aid night. Tony, what's the date? Uh, right here, same place. Financial aid night is, just, I looked at it today so I could share it with you. I hope I have it right. December 4th. December 4th at 6.30, right back here. But you'll get another email about it. And by then, my guidance website will be up and running. So it'll be on the, the guidance website as well. Any other questions for Bill? Here's one. Hi, I, I have one daughter that's a senior, but I also have a daughter that graduated two years ago. She's a sophomore in community college, and she's doing coursework, like 30 credits to get into another college. Does she have a chance of getting a scholarship too? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that, because that's, that's one piece that we really didn't touch upon. Yes, very, very definitely, but not at every institution. You want to find out what, they, what the institutions have in terms of transfer scholarships. If she is a participant in the uh, NJ STARS program at the community college, senior institutions in New Jersey may have money to go toward that. Institutions may have money only for students who complete associate's degrees and won't give scholarships unless the student does. So you want to look at the institutions and specifically what they offer for, uh, for transfer students. But yes, you will find transfer scholarships available. We still have the, new, um, the NJ STARS program. It hasn't been modified. It's been modified frequently, <laughs> but yes, the NJ Stars program still exists. I think it's now the top 15 percent. 
15. It's the top 15% out of high school. And then if you complete the associate's degree in the NJ STARS program, you can get a grant at the, at the senior institution. It used to be full tuition. It's not anymore. It's a grant. Uh, I can't remember what it is. It's a couple thousand dollars. If, if anyone is considering a community college and your child is a very strong student, I encourage you to Google, if you don't know what NJ Stars is, just Google NJ Stars. Um, it's a wonderful program. The two years of community college is paid for, tuition is paid for through this program if, if your child qualifies. And then transferring to certain schools in state Ryder being one of them, the, I believe it carries, it carries over after the transfer. Okay, any other questions? I thank you for your patience. Oh, here's a question. Here's a question, I'm sorry. All right. I'm a, you know, uh, sorry, I'm a, um, veteran of the United States military, do you uh, provide scholarships to disabled American veterans, children? And also the second, the B part question is, my son's father passed away and he was a scholar, upon scholars from uh, Seton Hall. Would that apply in any way to my son's scholarship? Do you get the, the first part? I got the first part. I'm not sure I completely understood the second part. If you are a veteran, absolutely speak with the Veterans Affairs Office at the institutions that you're considering because not only might there be money available to you as the son or daughter of a veteran or to your son or daughter if you are a veteran, but you may also be able to apply your GI benefits to your sons and daughters, and many people don't know that, and that's a really, really big savings, okay? I didn't understand the second part of your question, though. I don't know, if, could you restate it? My, uh, my son's father passed away, so, and he was on a scholarship. He was a graduate of, of Seton Hall University. Would he be able to, re, to go to Seton Hall for writer? I'm going to generalize your question because I think it's a valid one. And I'm going to address it partly as a legacy question. If you have a parent or a grandparent, living or deceased, who attended an institution that you're considering, ask if there are legacy benefits. We offer a $2,000 legacy grant every year for children of alumni. There may also be benefits at other institutions that are tied to a student's family connection. The best thing for you to do is ask that, in, that question of each individual institution because the answers are going to vary greatly. Okay. Was there another question up top? There is. Okay. Hi. Um, this question is more of a logistical question and it might not necessarily apply um, except to LHS personnel, but if you, uh, if your child is applying to a school that does not use the common application, um, how do you go about getting transcripts and recommendations in, if you're not using Navient's, um, because it's not using the common application. And also, if there's a recommendation that's not from school personnel, such as a community leader or someone, uh, you know, a government personnel, like you mentioned, but who wouldn't necessarily have access to Navients in order to, you know, put their recommendation in so that the school gets it. Okay, I heard the second part. Um, what, was the, what was the first part of the question? The first part is, if a school doesn't participate with the common application, how does the transcript and recommendations 
uh, can Navien still be used and can it be communicated to a school that's not using the Common App? Yeah, it's, it's very simple. Um, for non-Common App schools, um, there's a process for that. Um, it still goes through Navient's um, through something called School Docs. So we send uh, the application to transcript in uh, all the same way. The second part of your question had to do with recommendations from outside the school. Um, with recommendations, I always tell uh, students and parents to follow the directions that the college asks for. If the college is saying they only want two recommendations, um, then I recommend that you stick with the two. And usually it's best that they stay within the school in that situation. Um, but then beyond that, if there's no specific recommendations or guidelines, um, I would just do the convenience of the sender. So just have them, you know, you wouldn't have someone from the outside who's got great things to say about your child try to navigate through the Naviance process. Just have them send it directly to um, the college. And what Bill said earlier about getting to know your regional representative from the college, maybe give an email saying, look, I have this recommendation coming from the outside. Be on the lookout for it. Well, I want to thank Bill for coming out tonight um, and, and having a wonderful presentation. Thanks a lot, Bill. I appreciate it. I want to I thank everyone here for being patient through all the noise of the fans and the, uh, the heat in here. It's probably about 20 degrees cooler outside. I'm not sure why it's so warm in here, but I guess it's part of high school. Um, we'll be around for a little bit if you have individual questions. I wish everyone a great senior year with your child and a great back to school night tonight. Thank you.